He rolls eyes. I hope. Everybody. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Once again, it is time for another edition of Grassroots Motorsports Live presented by CRC Industries. I'm JG Pastor Jack. You are here on a very, very special night. We are going to be installing a Willwood brake kit on our Corvette C5 Z06 in just a few minutes with the help of Michael Hamrick from Willwood Brakes. He is on the line from uh, Camarillo, California. He's gonna be joining us in just a few minutes to walk us through the rest of the process over here, giving us some very cool brake tech info. Before we get into all of that though, let me, uh, let me first say hi to uh, a lot of the folks that are here tonight. Oh, I see our, our friend Nancy is, uh, is on tonight and um, Nancy can see that I'm wearing street clothes and that means I'm getting dirty tonight. So I'm not wearing one of my fancy GRM shirts. Um, thank you for, very much for acquiring those. You always know when I'm just wearing a t-shirt, it's, it's going to end up with me just covered from head to toe in the stuff from under this car. So that's what we're doing tonight. All right, we've got a good crowd here tonight, so here's what I want us to do first. And this worked great last week. Everybody who's here needs to comment in the Facebook thread if you're watching us on Facebook. It's a little thing we do to kind of kind of game the numbers a little bit. I don't care what you say. Don't, don't worry about being funny or charming or anything. Just, you know, type the, the letter D. I, I don't care. Just make a comment. And when Facebook sees all those comments, we get all that extra Facebook mojo helps us spread the word to a lot of other people. It's just one of the ways we kind of fool their algorithm a little bit. Also, if you're kind enough and you want to go the extra step, throw us a like or throw us a share wherever you're watching us. And if you're, if you're watching us on YouTube, go ahead and subscribe to our feed. Um, and th thank you very much for all those, uh, all those things coming in. Somebody uh, mentioned that my uh, my jaw looked like it was it was back in good shape. Yes, thank you very much uh, for asking. I had uh, I had a wisdom tooth and some uh, some oral surgery done uh, last Thursday, um, and it's it's great. I'm back to talking again. I have I, I took the rest of my pain pills right before the show, so this should go super fine. I can't feel a thing. I don't really care if, care if I did though. Uh, but yeah, th thanks. I, I got a, some, some nice emails. Thanks everybody for following up on that. And I feel great. And we are back to making shows. We're going to get going here in just a second. Before we do though, check this out. Check this out right here. This is a new sign from our friends at Pen Grade Oil. I told you over a year ago when we started this thing that I was not, I, I, with the sales department came to me with something that didn't make sense 
to be on the show as far as our supporters, as far as our, our sponsors, we weren't going to do it. I was only going to bring stuff on this show that I knew that I liked, that I could stand here and talk to you live and tell you about because it was good. This stuff is cool. If you have an older car, if you have a car without roller lifters, anything you know made before the mid 80s, back when, when flat tappets were, um, were the law of the land and, or an old British car, an old Porsche, um, this is this is your sauce, baby. This is the stuff, uh, very high zinc content, very high phosphorus content. We'll be talking about that a little bit later, and they are proud supporters of our show. So check them out at pengrade.com. Uh, if you've got an older car, if you have a newer car, they've got formulations for newer stuff too, but especially if you've got something older, uh, you owe it to yourself, that is the hookup. Pengrade oil, uh, it is um, really the, the sort of original formulation of, of what they used to use back in the day with all that zinc, all that phosphorus that is fantastic for older engines. So we're very proud to have them aboard. Also, of course, our friends from CRC Industries. I got my hand cleaning towels right here. I will be going through a few of those tonight. This is another one of my new favorite CRC things. Of course, uh, we're gonna be actually using some brake clean tonight for its intended purposes. Check them out at crcindustries.com. Uh, if you need some shock absorbers, Coney Shocks, you are running out of time to get up to $70 off a set of Coney Shocks. Check them out, coney-na.com. I think Friday, I think the end of this week, that sale ends. So if you're on the fence, time to, time to yank the wallet out and give them a shout there at Coney and save a couple of bucks. Also, finally, our friends at Autobooks Aerobooks, autobooks-aerobooks.com, the world's greatest bookstore in Burbank, California, and on the internet with tens of thousands of books, magazines, DVDs on everything with wings, wheels, engines, pedals, or flippers. Fantastic place. Uh, Lynn St. James will be there in a couple weeks signing books. Really recommend you check them out. All right. Now that that has been taken care of, let's... Uh, See if we got any, any questions coming in. Jim says brakes will only slow you down. My cousin Jeannie is watching. Nice to have uh, friends and family involved in all of this. So let us get Michael on the line here. Michael, are you there, my friend? Oh, Michael's gone. Hang on, let me let me get him uh, get him queued up here. Oh, uh, looks like we dropped him off of Skype. Um, hey, David, come here for a minute. Stay, stay, stand over here and talk about something while, while, while I call Michael back. <laughs> How about a little... Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for Wait. Us. Well, everything going. No, you... David has no mic. Hey, there you are. Sorry, we, 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 we dropped off there. Let me, uh, let me get you... Okay, let me get you Okay, we're good. Nice, nice job. Oh, right. and, and nobody could hear you, by the way, because I have the mic on. I totally oh, forgot right. about that. Okay, here, here we go, though. Here's Michael Hamrick, everybody. <laughs> All right, Michael, are, are you there? Yes, I am. There we go. Isn't, isn't live TV fantastic? Um, okay, well, first off, welcome aboard. Thank you for, for taking, taking some time this evening to, uh, to come join us. So I have, uh, I, I, I've, I've actually done a little bit of recon work. I actually did some of, the, some of the install on this kit last night just to kind of 
feel my way around and figure out what we were doing. And so far, I'm, I'm very pleased. I'm very impressed. Everything goes on exactly according to the instructions. Everything, everything fits great. Everything is, is right there. The engineering all seems, seems high quality and, and sound. So let's get into some of the nuts and bolts here. And let's start off just in very, very broad terms. Just kind of talking about, about brakes and why we might want to upgrade them. I mean, at, at a very basic level, we're, we're taking the kinetic energy of a 3,000 pound object here and we're turning it into heat and we're, and we're doing that through friction. And we could, we, could, we could take that energy and turn it into any other kind of energy we, we want to because we want to get rid of that kinetic energy. Uh, heat is a very efficient thing to turn it into. We could you know, turn it into light, we could turn it into sound. Whenever you hit your brake pedal, your car goes, ah, but that's going to take a while to slow down. So, so when we're talking about upgrading a, a, a brake system, are we just talking about uh, basically physically making more heat faster and then dealing with the results of, of, of that heat? What other physical properties are we dealing with there when we're talking about wanting to go from stock brakes to better than stock brakes? So one of the main things that we're doing, especially on the Corvette series, what we're trying to do is actually take a bunch of the unsprung and rotational mass out of the brake system and then make it so that we'll have more repeatability and a better pedal feel. So something that's different than what's factory on that Corvette is, that's a floating caliper. There's a lot of compliance in that system. And then you'll see that the factory rotors front and rear, they're a one piece design. So there's a lot of weight and mass system. And then the design of how we configured the hat and rotor together, especially on this project, is so that it's floating so that it'll be dynamic throughout temperature ranges. So we actually have have the, the front rotor that's about to go on, on the car here. and. It's a, it, it's a two-piece rotor. There's an aluminum center. There's a, um, a, a ferrous metal outer uh, rotor, and it's connected by this really sort of clever um, T-nut, this slotted T-nut system that allows for differing rates of thermal expansion and, and actual you know, thermal expansion of, of this iron rotor. Is that yeah, you know, we talked a little bit about this the other day. Is that what we're actually seeing here? Is that that this this system with these these T nuts that are that are slotted, um, are they designed to allow this this outer rotor to sort of t take that heat thermally expand without without really affecting this this center hub as much? Correct. So any rotor, especially when you're using it for a performance application, is going to grow. So as the gro rotor grows, we want to allow it to be parallel to the face of the brake pad. So when it's a fixed mount hat rotor, the rotor is not going to be able to, we're not allowing it to grow on its diameter. So as it wants to do that, it starts to cup over or peel over, and that'll give you some adverse effects like consistent knockback, especially when the system's under high, hem high temperature. So the whole thing about a floating rotor assembly, a lot of people have a misconception that it's for side to side, but it's actually for allowing the rotor to grow on its diameter and then contract after it's cooled off. Okay, so so you're actually you're actually suspending that rotor to allow to allow more more radial con contraction and, and expansion than than you're, you're really worried about. About about side to side, so we're act, that's that's interesting. So we're actually going to get in, into um, doing the install here, and I've Rachel Raid a little bit of this. I've I've, I've loosened a few bolts, um, and gotten a few things ready. But we, you know, I, I am going to going to stress a little bit that this is not something that the home gamer should be afraid of. Um, there there's there's really there's not many complex operations in, involved here. It's mostly just wrench turning. You're not going to need a lot of specialized tools or equipment. Um, maybe the only thing you're gonna need that you might not have already uh, is a good set of deep 12-point sockets, um, which I, I had, had a nice set of shallow ones, but I don't have a good, good, good set of deep ones. Great excuse for me to go, go, go buy some, though. Um, is there anything I'm missing there, Michael? Is there any, any other tools or, or equipment you might recommend or, or any other prep work you might recommend before we before we would get started on, on this? 
So a lot of our brake kits that are designed for street applications, we don't stress the need to use safety wire. But with what you guys are going to be doing with this car, you definitely want to have safety wire and pliers available so that you can do that. Okay, and let me uh, let me actually show them the uh, the inside of the rotor hats. Um, when we bolted together these rotors, uh, you might not be able to see on camera, but all of the uh, the bolts affixing the uh, the hub to the rotor are pre-drilled for a 32,000 safety wire. Now, I did not have any 32,000 safety wire, and it's not arriving until Friday, according to uh, Amazon.com. So I have not yet safety wired these, but I will absolutely be getting around to doing that as soon as my uh, friendly UPS guy shows up with the order. And I'm not going to, just before you even ask, I'm not just going to take a single piece of safety wire and run it through each bolt and then wrap it around along you know, the, the last one. I'm going to do it right. At least I'm gonna start doing it right. And then, We'll see how we'll see how many pain pills I have left at that point. So we're we're about to, uh, we're about to get these stock stock brakes off. All you really need to get the stock stuff off is like a 15 millimeter wrench, an 18 millimeter wrench. It's all fairly basic hand tool stuff. Um, and I'll you know. All this stuff is just hand tied anyway, so it comes off pretty easy. So, Michael, while we're watching me uh, unscrew some some brackets here, tell us a little bit about Willwood um, in general. Give us give us an idea of the breadth and, and width of your applications. Obviously, you guys are big into the the uh, the, the pro touring scene. Um, yeah, I, I see I see a Mustang sitting right right behind you there that I recognize from some pro touring events, but um, how many cars do you guys have applications for? And uh, is it all just kits or can we, can we buy stuff piecemeal? How's, if I want to upgrade and go, go to Willwood for those upgrades, how do I do that? So a little history about Willwood. We got started back in 1977 with one gentleman, his name is William Wood or Bill Wood. What he started doing was getting associated with a lot of the Winston Cup racing. So just taking some of the calibers he was working on aircraft. He was in a lot of uh, Southern California aircraft um, companies. And taking the six mount four and sometimes six calipers and getting them on to some of those cup cars. As that started to transpire in the late 70s, during the 80s, you started seeing a lot more of the Willwood product on sprint cars and super track applications. So that's, those are big marketplaces for us. So we're very, very deep into circle track piecing. Um, probably in the early nineties, it was really our heyday of cup racing. But then as the 2000s started, and that's when I started at Willwood, we started dabbling a lot more in some of the street performance market. And since then, that's when you see us having cars like this Mustang behind me, um, all the way to Miatas, Hondas. And then we also do a lot of off-road stuff as well. Okay, good. so uh, we, have a, we have a couple of questions and I, was, I, I have, actually have this information written down here. Folks are asking about just uh, specific specs of the uh, rotors, uh, weights, and, 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 and measures. Weight-wise, I actually went through and weighed everything uh, on our fancy intercomp scales. Total weight of the system is actually nearly identical to the system that came off. So we're not gaining any lightness, but we are gaining uh, a ton of leverage and, and we're, we're gaining a lot of heat shedding capacity. So while we always preach, you know, lighten, lighten where you can, uh, sometimes we, we have to use a little bit of this mass to actually actually get rid of some of that heat. But I'm looking at my, my weights over here. Rear rotors, uh, the Willwood rotors are a pound lighter than our stock rotors. Front rotors are about half a pound heavier 
Um, calipers are nearly identical uh, from, from stock to the Willwoods. And if, if you look at just the, well, where's my brake pads here? You know, if we look at these, these rear pads, here's the stock rear pad versus Willwood's rear pad, you can see just an immense amount of additional, additional area there. So while we're not trading, trading you know, any, any lightness in, into the car, we are certainly adding leverage and we're, we're definitely adding some, uh, some thermal capacity here. So uh, tell me a little bit about the, the diameters on, on these because I, I, I forget off the top of my head, Michael, what, uh, what are the diameters of the, of the kit we're looking at here? So the, the front rotor is a 14 inch by uh, inch and a quarter. And the rear is a 12.88 by one inch. And it's gonna be a directional van here with our spec 37 reel. Okay. You can actually see the um, rotors are marked directionally here. So you could get them placed in the correct orientation. So what we're doing now is we are, uh, we are dropping a rotor onto the, uh, the, the, the front hub here. Now, one of the things, we, we've been emailing a little bit, Michael, and one of the things you stressed to me was um, as we get ready to test fit our brackets on here, when we're doing this operation, we wanna make sure that all of our mating surfaces are sort of spotlessly clean um, because we're, we're basically looking to, to get the rotor centered in the, uh, in, in the caliper so talk talk about that a little bit like like what kind of prep are we looking looking to do here as we as we um start our our test fitting as far as we're concerned willwood as a brake company the brake system is just as important as you assembling the engine for your vehicles so making sure that all the mating surfaces especially if it's had an old brake system on the car for some time Make sure that all of those areas are super, super clean because we're talking about a lot of close tolerances. And then when you go to install that bracket, you want to make sure that the mating surface is spotless because you want that bracket to be as perpendicular to the face of the rotor once the caliper is installed. Cool. And, and we actually, uh, I, I took these off earlier, so I, you know, I didn't need to wire brush them or anything, but we did wipe them off with a little CRC brake clean, ladies and gentlemen, because because of course we did. Um, all right, so you guys supply a new bracket. It's a nice uh, CNC aluminum bracket here and all new hardware for all this stuff. So the first thing we're gonna do is go into our uh, pile of shims here and we're gonna add a couple of shims to these brackets uh, to try and, try and get our side to side centering because you guys recommend starting with what, about 60 thousandths worth of worth of shims on, on the brackets for side to side. Is that, is that what I remember from the instructions there? Correct. So what happens with a lot of the cores throughout the years, you may have replaced hubs on that C5. The differences you need in those hubs will sometimes change the offset. So with the factory floating caliper, not as big of a deal if you were off 30 thousandths, but with a fixed mount, we provide those shims so that you can make sure that the caliper will be centered over the way. Okay, and the shims are just as, as simple as as these little metallic shims here. And you guys provide plenty of uh, plenty of different sizes, so we are gonna take my gloves off because I need some dexterity here. You guys can tell I didn't practice this with headphones on, so. Uh, let me take the rotor back off of there. Thank you. 
So what this uh, this this kit we are bolting on now, Michael. How many how many of these do you guys have have out there? What's who's who's the average the average person using this setup that we have have right now? Is it is it a track person? Is it somebody you know doing Optima Ultimate Streetcar? What's what's our, our typical mission for for this setup? Well, the kit was originally designed for a lot of the SDCA and and now that's able to run these particular brakes but what slowly has happened is <clears throat> because of how many uh, race teams and, and people that the USCA Optimus we've we've actually got quite a few of these brakes that are on a lot of the top top uh, guys running that series All right, so we've just run those bolts down to contact. We're not going to torque that yet because the first thing we're going to do is we're going to uh, we're going to check our horizontal offset of our rotor uh, with our caliper. And we're just snugging the uh, the rotor down to the to the hub so it stays centered. Now I'm not going to bolt that on yet. What I'm going to do first though is I am just going to give a, uh, a quick peek and see if we're even remotely close and if we're way off we'll move our shims around. But if we're close We will bolt that this down and measure for real. Forty-seven, eight, twenty-six. Uh, so, how close do we want to be on on these uh, the, these rotors being being centered in the the um, calipers, Michael? So, that's going to be something with any fixed mount caliper. That you want to be as close to center as possible. So there's really no given spec, but what I like to tell people is we want to be as close as possible, but no more than say 15 or 20,000. Okay. Of being and that's really important because with a fixed mount caliper, we've got even amounts of clamping hooks on both faces. And if the caliper is not centered, You'll, you'll find that the caliper wants to kind of move over to the side. And if you're talking about a lot of stuff getting hot and that repeatability of the brake pedal feel that we're looking for, the better everything is centered, the better the brake pedal is going to stay perpendicular to the face So you're, we, we keep coming back to the concept of, of thermal expansion and, and dealing with this heat. When we have two different metals like like this in a in a brake system, we have we have metal and, and we have steel. I I would imagine the engineering required to, to sort of keep all this stuff, um, you know, pr properly tuned and, and 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 properly functional can can be tricky. T tell us about your development process a little bit. What's what's your what's your path to to, to market for for a system if you're if you're starting out you know, d developing a, a new system for a car. But typically on a car like this, it's going to come with a lot of development from racing series. So we may take a lot of what we've learned from say asphalt super track racing, where those are very demanding brake systems and a small size wheel, smaller brakes. But we're not able to dissipate that heat as well as say this 15 inch that's going to be installed in an 18 inch wheel. In a lot of those cases, it's a 12 inch rotor that's inside of a 15 inch wheel. So the management of temperature is very important and making sure that all of our tolerances and as the rotor expands and contracts, it's staying square in the brake pad. So. Okay, we got some good questions that are, um, are, are stacking up here. So let me get, let me get to, to a couple of these, but um, let let's talk a little bit about where where was it? Um, 
Okay, so regarding the, the same thing we just talked about, metallurgy and, and dealing with heat, talk a little bit about, about you guys recommend any sort of treatments? Um, I mean, we hear a lot of stuff about like cryo-treating rotors. We hear about different ways to sort of alter the molecular structure of the, of the metal to get it to deal with, with heat better. Is there, is there real science there? Is there anything there you guys believe in? And as long as we're, we're busting myths a little bit, um, talk to us a little bit about, about venting. I mean, these, these rotors are, are uh, slotted a, a little bit to provide for some outgassing, but they're, they're not cross-drilled. Um, they are vented in, in here. So what's, what's uh, Willwood's position on that? Because I, I know there's, you know, it, it, it's like, what, what's the best way to get, get to the airport? Everybody has a, a feeling about, about cross-drilling, about, about, uh, about slotting. What's, what's, what's your position on it? So I, I, I could go and I could talk for an hour about this, the development of what goes into a rotor and then also choosing the correct rotor for the application. So if you were building this car and you were just going to take it to Corvette shows and show it off with a really nice 18 inch wheel, running a drilled and slotted rotor would have been really fun. But for what you're going to be using, we want to go with a slotted only. And the slots are actually just cleaning the leading edge of the brake pad. And again, when you're going to be when you're driving, you're going to be using an expendable item such as the brake pad. So cleaning that leading edge is really important. Now, the reason that people cross their road back in the past it used to be because you're using uh, uh, brake pads that were made from asbestos. They were organic. And as those brake pads heated up, especially during performance driving, you have to get that outgas. So by cooling the rotor, you outgas and not have any kind of pocket of gases that would be trapped in the brake pad and the face of the rotor. But because all brake pads, especially from Willwood, are all semi-metallic, we don't need to worry about that anymore. So the best way to explain why we don't want to use a drill rotor for an application like this, think about the rotor as you radiate. If you have a plotted only rotor and it has not been drilled, imagine that that's close to say a four radiator. But when you drill the rotor, you're taking mass from the rotor. So it's not gonna be able to take that temperature, hold it and dissipate it as well for you. Another thing that keeps coming up, and you've brought it up a few times, is rotors expand and contract. Stuff's moving. So when you've got holes in your rotor, you're going to put a lot of fatigue into that part because it's expanding and contracting. So for performance driving or racing, track days, really hard autocross, we want to have a slotted only rotor on our application. Gotcha. Okay, so we were within uh, about four thousandths on on the side to side. So I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and call that um, call, call that good good enough for for our purposes. And the next thing we're doing here is we are getting our um, our vertical spacing set. And I'm basically putting the uh, the same spacer setup I used on the other side on uh, on this side. And we'll we'll see if we'll see if that works out now. One thing that we had uh, we had talked about a, a little bit as we were we were doing this is you you've got and actually this is the first time I I've heard this you you've got a um, different approach than I had heard before as far as orienting the, um, the the pads with the rotors you like to have a little bit of overhang uh, of on on the pads of of the rotors so but basically you want the 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 outside diameter of the rotor to be slightly below the, the top of the pads when they're they're sitting on the um, on the bracket. So uh, talk, talk to us about about that a little bit. What's the what? And it, it makes complete sense when you when you explain it. But uh, give us give us the explanation for that there, Michael. So again, in a performance application, especially a car that you're going to be doing track days and or a race car, the reason there's a few reasons for the radial mount type of caliper. But one thing that's really nice is you can adjust your radial height to the radius of the rotor. And by doing that, 
what happens, and it is reoccurring, and I'm going to bring it up again, but under temperature, that rotor is going to expand. So if the brake pad is sitting lower on the annulus of the rotor and it starts to grow, you're not going to be wearing the outer edge of that rotor. So what we'll typically do is explain to a race team, probably shim the caliper 30 to 60 thousands over the radius of the outside diameter of the rotor. This way, as the rotor expands, it'll meet on its swept area or another word for that is annulus. Okay. Um, all right, before I, I pop this caliper back on here, let's take a look at the piston setup you guys have in here. This is six piston caliper. And we can see that the uh, diameter of these pistons is is not equal across the the um, area of the pad. What's going on there? I mean, clearly that is that that's an intentional dis decision. What's the uh, what's what's the thought behind the the varying varying diameters of of um, pistons there? So there's a misconception that people think that a six piston brake is going to be better for them than say a four piston. But depending on the application, a four or six piston caliper is going to be better suited. For a performance application, especially in a caliper like this Aero 6, where it has a six inch long brake pad, we want to keep any of the pad taper down to a minimum. So if we had even sized pistons, run spec. What happens with a brake pad, and you've heard this term before in racing, but the leading edge, the leading edge of the brake pad is going to wear more than the tail end of the brake pad. So by staggering the pistons, going from small pistons to large, we can keep some of that pad taper down to a minimum. So that's the, the main reason why we have a staggered caliper on this pad. All right, so we were uh, we were close there on our shims. I am going to add just a little more shim to both of the top and bottom fastener here, and I think we will be in um, pretty good shape on our height. Let's take an actual measurement here because I think we're close to where we want to be. So I got about oh about forty thousandths worth of uh, worth of overhang on these pads here. Now we're within about four thousand side to side, so I think we're in pretty good shape. Chris, come come around here and you can kind of get a get a better view of what we're talking about. When we're saying we want the pad to overhang the uh, the rotor a little bit, so here's the here's the pad here. Here's our pad. Here's our rotor. We've got just a little bit of a of a lip in there. It's going to allow this rotor to expand radially and and match up more precisely with this pad at operating temperature, which is when things are going to be they're they're most sensitive basically um, all right so let's get this bolted down a little better um, I, I do like the hardware a lot here I'm, I'm looking at the uh, the bolts that that are holding the uh, the caliper down onto the mount and one thing that we had on on our list that we wanted to talk about was proper torque settings um, yeah we, we we try and try and stress that when you're doing a job, you know, do it, do it right. But, but give us the, give us the engineering version. Give us the actual uh, guy that has probably had to field calls from people that put their stuff on improperly because um, they they did not take the time to properly torque stuff. Why why are our our precise torque settings so important on all of the, all of this brake hardware? No, oh, something that I had emailed you is <laughs> the whole fact of. Someone's going to build an engine for their car, and they're very critical about making sure everything's torqued to the correct specification. Well, why wouldn't you take those same steps and do that for your brake system? That's a really integral, important piece of your vehicle's performance. So, 
making sure that you go through the installation sheet that we provide with every kit and or calling us and making sure and verifying what the bolt torque specs are is really important to making sure that you're not going to have any problems down the road. Yeah, and I think it's it's important to mention we keep coming back to back to to temperatures and and, and stresses here, especially when you're dealing with with uh, with brake stuff and brake stuff on a heavy car. I mean, we're going to be talking about even on a, a mildly driven track car, you're probably talking about what seven, eight hundred, even more um, degrees of temperature in these front rotors at times, and you've got you know. You're, you're, you're talking about tolerances changing. You're talking about physical dimensions of, of, of things changing. You know, trust the people that, that actually did the math to figure out how tight that stuff was supposed to be and, and how it was, it was supposed, to, supposed to seal together. As, he, he, you know, my, he's right. Michael, when, when he makes the point, you spend a lot of time uh, getting proper torque specs in your engine, guess what? If your engine blows on track, you can easily coast to the side of the road and stop. If your brakes go out because you did something stupid when you were putting them together, you're going to have a much more difficult time at 130 miles an hour dealing, dealing with that stuff. Um, what about chemical fasteners too here, Michael? Are we going to be, once we uh, get these adjusted and right, are, are we going to be applying um, some kind of a, a chemical fastener to these and, and which, which joints are, are, are right for those? So we typically specify using one red Loctite on all of your fasteners. I don't suggest using them on your 12 point uh, caliper nuts, the ones that you just installed for the radial mount bracket, because that's going to be a pinched nut or a um, I forget the name of, of the type of bolt it is, but... Uh, it's a prevailing it's torque fastener, actually, yes. Yeah, so that one is designed that you don't need it. But your your hat to rotor hardware, and especially your caliper bracket to, to spindle, very important that those are all going to be uh, uh, loctited, torqued to their specification, and then also on the hat rotors, make sure because those come as 12 points with uh, the safety wiring. Make sure you safety wire. Yeah, yeah, and that's uh, I, that is going to be this weekend's project. I'm looking forward to it. Um, we're gonna we're gonna have a little safety wire part. I'm actually gonna gonna um, increase my safety wire skill a little bit because I I, I have yeah. been guilty in in the past of, um, of playing it fast and loose with some of the safety wire and just kind of sticking it through there and wrapping it around going it's fine I'll, I'll be fine uh, so yeah we, we, we mentioned before these are uh, a prevailing torque type fastener you can see that they're not completely round um, so it actually applies some uh, some torque to the nut and that's that's how how these seal um, we're going to move to the back of you. So uh, essentially, we've got to go through, properly torque everything, put, uh, put our, our, um, our, our line in. But that is it for, for the actual physical installation. Um, everything, of course, needs to be properly fastened. But that, that, is, that is the steps. It is, it is not a difficult process. If you are out there thinking, you know, can I do this myself? Is this something I can... I, I can tackle, yeah. I mean, it, except for the bleeding process, which it's handy to have have a, have a second person. And we'll talk about best practices for bleeding these multi-piston calipers in a little bit. But this is something that is perfectly within the reach of of the uh, the, the home gamer. All right, uh, Michael, we're going to take a little break here, do a little bit of housekeeping. When we come back to you, we will talk about the rear brakes because you guys got a really slick kit that actually uh, allows us to retain the factory parking brake, which, uh, which, which we definitely appreciate. So we'll be back to you in just a couple minutes. In the meantime, let us talk a little bit about the folks that make this show possible. First off, let me, um, uh, okay, so Patrick Carity is letting me know that the, uh, the Capitals are leading 3-1 midway through, through the second. Yes, in that, in that historic and, and time-honored tradition of, of hockey that is known as 
Las Vegas versus Washington. I, I guess the only thing that could be worse than that is if we had a uh, a Las Vegas versus Tampa Stanley Cup. Like every Canadian would like would storm the border and literally just just start punching people at Dunkin' Donuts and like throwing Tim Hortons coffee on them. If if we had a a, a Las Vegas Tampa uh, Stanley Cup. All right, let me uh, get caught up here with um, any questions. Uh, Andrew, good question about the pad overhang. We will get to that in uh, in the second half here. And uh, Dinesh, good question about um, dual piston setups and uh, and 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 si single piston setups. We'll talk a little bit about about the about pressures when we when we come back. Um, do, 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 and Danny, we will ask him about uh, the rears of of that Camaro when we get back too, folks. Uh, did did you see? Did did you see? Were you here? Were you here when it happened? I actually got to use uh, some CRC brake clean, and because this is a can of CRC Pro Series brake clean, that means I will not have to grab a fresh can of brake clean anytime soon. Because don't we all know the only thing better than brake clean is even more brake clean. Um, CRC brake clean pro series in stores now as we speak. This stuff was originally introduced only to um, only to industry. It is the same exact brake clean that you, you get in the smaller cans. The cans are just bigger because more brake clean is always better. And this stuff, uh, I saw it in Lowe's. I saw it in O'Reilly Auto Parts. Uh, it's also in AutoZone. It's in Napa. Um, and I think it's in, I think it's in our Walmart too. So anywhere you get brake clean, you can get this stuff. CRC, proud supporters of this show. We are honored to have them aboard. Also, I want you to check out our friends at Auto Books, Aero Books. Uh, Lynn St. James herself is going to be there in just a couple weeks signing her new book. And also you can check out uh, a book on brake technology by our friend James Walker, former Grassroots Motorsports, a freelance writer. Um, we'll throw up a link to that book as well. Auto Books, Aero Books there in Burbank, California. If you have a chance to go there in person, definitely recommend you do that. If you can't, hit them up on the internet, autobooks-aerobooks.com. But it is the coolest bookstore in the entire world. Books, magazines, DVDs, collectibles, tens of thousands of things in stock. And it is a cool place to hang out and a cool place to spend a lot of time on their website browsing. Also, uh, Chris, walk with me. Show them our new friends at Pen Grade Oil. Uh, here, here's, remember I told you, I, I'm not gonna, you know, if our sales department came to me and said, hey, we got this cool new product for you, we'd love to, to have on the show. Oh, hey, great, what is it? Uh, you know what, it's cigarettes for kids. You know what, no, no, I'm not gonna do that. I'm only gonna do stuff that, stuff that I can stand up here with a good conscience and talk about intelligently and tell you that it's good, tell you that it works, because if you use it and you see me, I want you to like me. That's really all I want. And here is what's cool about this stuff. Back, back in, in olden times, in the 80s, back when, back when Duran Duran was just a bunch of young kids with uh, parachute pants, engines had, um, they, they had flat top lifters. There was a lot of metal to metal pressure between the internal parts of engines. So oil companies put a lot of zinc, a lot of phosphorus, these soft, metallic compounds into their oil, which help protect those very, very high pressure metal to metal contact areas. Well, engines got more high tech, stuff like roller lifters were, were in, introduced. So that those metal on metal pressur pressures in modern engines were, were reduced. Because of that, the oil manufacturer was responded by taking some of those additives, those, those zinc and phosphorus additives, out of their oils, make them easier to produce, make them, uh, make them more compatible with more modern engines. But we still have awesome old cars. We still have Porsche 911s and 68 Camaros and Datsun 240Zs and all kinds of this cool stuff that needs a good oil with a lot of zinc and a lot of phosphorus. And that is where pen grade comes in. They are pretty much the only game in town when it comes to getting a good old school oil for your classic car. So much so that they are the official oil of the Porsche Club of America and the Indy 500. But I, I, I can't really think of anything with more credibility than uh, if the Porsche Club of America thinks something is okay, it's probably pretty good. So check them out at pengrade.com. We're gonna have one of their techs on the show in just a couple weeks to talk all about oil. And I know that is a uh, quasi-religious subject for a lot of people, but 
again, if you got something that uh, that needs needs the old stuff, the old good classic dinosaur uh, phosphorus and zinc filled stuff, that is the hookup right there, baby. Pengrade.com. Let us uh, now go to our friend Coney Man. Um, we, have, we have one visit, quick visit from Coney Man tonight. He's going to tell you about the sale that is ending in a couple of days. Uh, it's going to be it's going to be a quickie. Uh, but I, here's the thing I want you to remember here: if you need Coney shocks, if you need any kind of shock, you, you can get Coney's. It's up to seventy dollars off. Ends like I think it might end midnight tomorrow. So let me uh, let me throw our friend Coney Man up here real quick. Hey, shop now. He's back, Coney Man. Does your car bounce more than a sugared up toddler on a trampoline? It's time to upgrade your shocks. For a limited time, take advantage of the Coney improved mail-in rebate and get up to $70 off. Don't wait, shop now. He's back, Coney Man. Does your car bounce like a check from your deadbeat cousin? Then it's time to upgrade your shocks. For a limited time, take advantage of the Coney improved mail-in rebate and get up to $70 off. Don't wait. Shop now. All right. So, uh, again, last chance for a great deal on Coney's. And I still, I, I still say that um, Coney Man is suffering from a deep and pervasive sadness um, that maybe only we can help him with. But I, I want you guys to come on this journey with me, and together, uh, I think I think you and I can work on saving Coney Man because he uh, he's I think he's got a lot of bitterness towards his girlfriend. I think he's got bitterness towards the the cousin that stiffed him on the check, and I think it's up to you and me to to kind of help him out. So we're we're gonna I'm I, I got a call with them tomorrow. We're gonna find some ways to help Coney Man. I think uh, because I think we owe it to him. Let us get back to Michael Hamrick here. Michael, thank you for hanging on through the break there. Um, tell us a little bit about. I've been, I've been looking at that cool uh, Mustang behind you this this whole time, and it looks. I'm thinking 67, 68. Um, tell us a little bit about what we're what we're looking at back there while I, I get moved to the to the back of the car here. Uh, this is a car that we built about five years ago, four years ago. A '66 Mustang. Um, Built completely in house. The only thing that wasn't done in house was the body with the paint. Um, Coyote, uh, Tremec, Magnum 60, uh, Strange Bull floating rear end, the full PCI chassis underneath it. It's quite a really, really cool approach street car. I competed with the car in 2015 in the Optima series and finished 14th overall. It's a good car. That's awesome. Uh, all right, let's go to a couple of questions here while we get started um, taking these, these rears apart. Okay, uh, great question here from, uh, where, where, where was it? Um, uh, oh, from, from, from our, our friend uh, Rainer. We've been talking a lot about brake temperatures tonight and all the heat that goes into a brake system. Uh, give us give us some some ideas for possibly monitoring the temperature in in a brake system. Is there anything we can do to kind of see what temperatures we're dealing with and um, and and what what temperatures are okay? Is there sort of a minimum temperature we want to 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 achieve with a, with a certain compound pad to get the brakes to start working? What what are we looking at? You know, what kind of temperatures are, are we dealing with? How do we measure them? And what do we do with them once we figure them out? Well, that's that. That's kind of a loaded question. There's a, there's a lot of answers to that. So when, when we're dealing with a customer who's buying a brake kit like this, we'll go through and find out what their skill level is, what they're going to be doing with the car, what tire they're going to be using, what tracks, autocross. Is it a tight autocross? Is it a wide open autocross? Get some, get some feedback from them so that we can select brake pads that are going to work optimal for everything that they're doing. Um, like in this case, we've been dealing with quite a few of our customers that have given us feedback over the years, really good feedback. And we've, we've been testing what's called our BP-30 material. So that's what I've sent you guys for this part. Um, 
really good high temperature. It's not going to be great on the street, but it's going to work a good high temperature. Um, usually, you'll start to see this pad start to come in somewhere between 400 and 500 degrees. Um, but it'll, it'll, it'll exceed over 1,200 degrees, no problem. So like on a road course, it'll be fine. Um, no, knowing what type of a driver, that's, that's where I really tried to work with guys who maybe starting off as a novice, then turning intermediate. Now you're talking about getting them into a different brake pad and then going from intermediate to more of a pro you know that you've got to step up your game and, and get the right formulated brake pad for what they're going to be doing with the car. And, it, and it's going to have to suit them. Yeah, because it, it, ultimately it's a, it's a fairly personal decision because it, 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 it has to match your, your driving technique and it has to match sort of your personal taste. I mean, it's very much like buying a set of, or a pair of shoes that a, a pair of shoes that feels good on me might not feel good on, on somebody else just because of the way you know, I, I hold my legs, the way my particular uh, body and, and, and bone stru structure is, or the way my feet are shaped. So it, it's kind of this per personal decision as to, as to what type of pads you're ultimately gonna, gonna use. Although you guys can probably get somebody in the ballpark. How many different choices are we looking at within, um, within your lab? And actually, let me, let me take, uh, take, let me get noisy here for one second and take this bolt off. Uh, it's probably gonna cut you off for a second, but let me uh, do this before you answer. All right, go, go ahead, Michael, sorry. So something that we need to always do is when, when you're going to keep a brake system for your car, and in this case, it's gonna be one that's completely simplification. You need to make sure that if it's gonna be a street car, you may want to have a street pad. So something more like our BP-10 or our BP-20 material would be better suited if you're going to drive the car Monday through Friday to work. But when you get to the track, depending on what you're doing, the PP20 may work totally fine if it's going to be an autocross for the weekend. But if you're going to take the car out and do an open track day, you're going to have to change pads to a, a better formulated pad that's going to be able to take that temperature because we want you to go out and have the best possible time with the brakes that, you, that you've just purchased. But sometimes that means that if it's going to be a multi-purpose car, we may need to change pads between those applications. Yeah, you, you can't have all your groceries in one bag and still have that bag be light. You're going to have to have to make make a decision, you know, as to as to what what um, venue you're going to you're you're willing to sacrifice some performance at, which venue you want to maximize performance on. Uh, let me go back to a couple questions, Dennis. I, I see your question there. We'll get to that in a second. Our friend uh, Danny Kao was asking about rear brakes for autocrossing on uh, the latest gen generation Camaro. Uh, do you want to go with the wide rear rotor or the narrower rear rotor? And I, I, looking at your, your catalog there, I see you guys have a lot of options for different width setups. What are, what are some of the advantages and disadvantages for for the, the the wider wider rotors versus versus the narrower rotors, and you know specifically on our friend uh, Danny's Camaro there. So depending on what the application is, meaning like the six gen Camaro, yeah, I know for a fact I know for a fact that we use our Aero four piston caliper on the back of that car, and I believe we use an inch one hundred thick rotor, whereas in the front we use an inch and a quarter thick rotor. Because we're doing much more shopping with the front end of most of these cars, not all cars, but most cars, we're going to want to have better thermal capability in the front than we do in the rear. On your particular application, Danny, we have to go with a 14 and a quarter inch rotor because of the way that the rear trailing arm or upright spindle is designed. That is the only diameter that we're able to fix our caliper to with a radial mount bracket. To, to go a little bit further into this, 
what we'll sometimes do is work with the customer to figure out how we can put as much brake into the car, but not too much brake. So you'll find some of the guys that say run up the Optima series, like Mike Meyer and his 66 Mustang. It's over 700 horsepower, Roush Eats power plant, but we're running literally the same brake in the front as we are in this Corvette. But on the rear, we're only using an 11 and three quarter inch, 810 thick rotor. And it's because that car doesn't need as much rear brake because it's much lighter. So when you, when you, when you say stuff like, too much break. What is what's going to be an indication of that? I mean, I, you know, I I'm almost of of a mind sometimes that you you know there's no such thing as too much of anything. You just you just don't put your foot on on the pedal as hard. But what when you when you talk about too much break or, or having having too much break for an application, what are some of the the signs you're looking for that, that you might be be getting into that that range of overkill or at least diminishing returns? So there's two different ways that you can look at having too much weight. One way is having too much rotational mainstream weight. So for instance, on this P5, we could put a 14-inch rotor with an Aero 4 caliper, and although it would look great, it's not needed. We want to keep the rotational and unsprung weight down, and as you had talked earlier, we're just about a wash. But where we've really increased our braking capability is going to a two-piece hat rotor and being able to dissipate that heat into the hat. And then with the caliper, you could see how much more cubic volume the brake pad that we offer in this rear brake kit was over the factory caliper. So there's some times where you don't want to put too much brake because it's unsprung and rotational mass you've got to carry around. But then there's also times when you over piston or change the bias dramatically with too large of a piston. That's another way of over braking the car and that'll have adverse effects. And, and actually that, that leads me to a good question we had earlier that we didn't get to. Um, when we're talking about, about going to a, a, a multi-piston caliper, what what's the difference between a single large piston and multiple small pistons you know if given the same sort of volume and area is the braking performance going to be similar whether it's one giant piston or three tiny ones what what are we what are we gaining by by adding those physical pistons i mean obviously we're we're gaining a lot in being able to press a wider pad more evenly against against the surface is is that is that really really the main goal there well, what I like that you said was a big single piston compared to three small pistons. And a misconception that people have is when we took off the front brakes off this Corvette, it had one or two pistons. Was it two pistons, two, JG? Two, yeah. Okay. So the square area of those two pistons, let's say that they equaled four and a half uh, square inches. Okay. Then when we go to a fixed mount caliper, meaning a caliper that has opposing pistons and clamps down evenly on both faces of the rotor, when we calculate cubic, or excuse me, um, uh, square area, we only calculate half of the caliper. And it's because of the physics of what's happening. When you have a, a floating caliper with two pistons on the inboard, you're pushing and pulling. We only calculate the inboard pistons because there are only inboard pistons. But on a fixed mount, we only calculate half of the pistons and it's because it'd be the same as if you took your finger and your thumb and you squeeze them together and ask which one is clamping down harder. Okay. You can't answer that question. So you have to negate half of those. So we only count half of the pistons. When we design a brake system, especially on a performance-driven car like the Corvette, we try to stay pretty close to the factory bias. So if we increase the front braking by 2%, we may try to only increase the braking by 2% in the rear so that it keeps the bias proper in the vehicle. Gotcha. Okay, yeah, that, 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 that's an interesting, interesting way to put it. And um, thanks for answering Danny's question there. Okay, we're, uh, I got a couple things I want to ask you about before we go. Uh, let me let me first show people 
a couple of details on these rears that I like. The, the process for installing the rear is essentially the same as installing the front. We're gonna, we'll, we'll, we'll shim out these uh, mounts horizontally, then we'll, then we'll shim them out vertically. But one thing I really dig about uh, this rear setup is it does use a um, rotor inner that literally slides right over the stock parking brake. These are the, uh, the stock parking brake shoes right here. And you don't have to disconnect the parking brake. You don't have to do anything. With it. It's a, just a literal bolt-on, slide-on um, upgrade that you don't have to worry about messing with any of your, your parking brakes. A couple of yanks on the lever, you'll adjust that parking brake up to, to that, that new shoe. So it's a fantastic addition for a street car or spend a lot of time loading my trailer by myself. So I, I got to yank that parking brake up to kind of see where the car is. It's nice having it, you know, it, it yeah, you can give up a, a pound or two by getting rid of a parking brake on a, on a track only car, but um, this is a very, very easy solution. I like the way the Willwoods en engineered this solution for just being able to slip it right on there and, um, and, and have it ready to go. So uh, well done on that, Michael. So let's, before we go here, um, I want to talk a little bit about bleeding um, because we didn't really get get into that yet. And we're not going to get into bleeding tonight because it's you know boring as hell to watch. But but I, I do want to bring it up a little bit. So Chris, let's let's you and I go back around to the front where the um, where the fan is because I like it a lot more there. And um, we can kind of use this caliper as a visual aid. So when it comes time to to bleed these, uh, this brake system down, obviously we've got no fluid in any of these, these calipers at this point. Um, I, I, look at, I look at this caliper and it's got four separate bleed screws on it because it's got four separate pistons. Michael, what is, give, give me some best practices and some, and some um, good approaches here for bleeding a, a, a multi-piston caliper system, especially one that's, uh, that, that's dry that we're just putting new fluid into. So keep in mind that that particular rear caliper is designed so that it can be a left or right hand mount. But once the caliper is mounted in the left or right hand uh, side of the car, we're only going to bleed the bleeders facing up. And on that particular super light, what we'd want to start with is the right rear of the car and do the outboard, then the inboard of the caliper, and then kiss the outboard one more time to make sure that we've got all of the air that may be trapped in that caliper out of it. And when we move to the front on those aerolite calipers, you may go in and look, but there are bleeders on the outboard body. There's only bleeders on the okay. inboard. Okay. So on those front calipers, you're only going to bleed the inboard that's facing up. Okay. So, so both of... The way yeah. that the caliper is designed is it's going to be able to get all of the air out of that outboard body. So both of those bleeders lead to the same the same chamber. So you're you're not really there. there there's no air that you're going to going to miss um, by by not using those those other other screws. Um, okay, cool. So that that's actually um, very very handy. So these calipers also look like they uh, they, they come apart fa fairly easily a couple of screws here what's the what's the rebuild situation on on, on these calipers is that is that something that um, that eventually is gonna gonna need to be done is there is there a service life is there a, a serv you know if they exceed a certain temperature or, or are there any signs that you might need to look at at splitting these open and 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 servicing them them inter internally um, something that I try to tell people to do is, depending on how much they're going to be using the car, it's a good thing to service the calipers one to two times a year. Okay. So at the, at the end of the year, it's always a good thing to service them. If you'd like, I'm going to walk over here real quick. And because you brought this up, we do a lot of off-road applications. And check these calipers out. Oh, wow. These are used on a King of the Hammers Ultra 4 car. And what I've done is I've gone through and cleaned them up as well as I can. But you can see how beat up they are, right? Yeah, those look like they've been, uh, been well used. So there's absolutely nothing wrong with them. 
And what I've done is checked all of the blues into the display gate. So once I clean them up, I'll go through, check all the blues, and those calipers are nickel plated. So all the blues are in perfect shape. I don't even split the caliper in half. I'll go through and put that all of the bolts that are existing on the caliper again, and then rebuild it. And that's it. Okay. Awesome. That and uh, all of those, all of that maintenance stuff is available right, right from you guys. I would imagine that's stuff you guys keep keep in stock for folks that are that are going through and and servicing their their pieces. Oh, of, of course. And every caliper, and in the part of the caliper, when you go to our website, it'll give you the rebuild kit. Oh, part cool. Number. Awesome. Uh, all right, Michael, we are going to um, to say good night here. Thank you very much for hanging out with us tonight. This was this was enlightening. It's um, it's a very simple physical process, just taking motion and turning it into heat. But it, it it's amazing how much how much complexity goes goes into that. Give us uh, oh, um, I, I I also want, want to mention that um, video the fantastic videos that I watched before this available from Willwood. You guys have uh, have videos on installs of, of most of your kits. I know the one for the C5 was quick and easy to follow. It's a five minute video that walks you through the whole process. We've stretched it out to an hour here tonight and didn't even finish, but we were, we, we were, we, we had other, other agendas, but um, is it, uh, are there, are there videos available for install for, for, uh, you know, deep into your lineup for that stuff? Oh, of course there is. So even if, if you don't find a video for a particular kit, we can usually get you into another car's video that is very similar. Awesome. All right, man. We we are excited. Um, we're gonna get uh, gonna get these finished up before the weekend. Get them out there. Get them bedded. Um, I, well, actually, actually, before we go, walk us through the the bedding process uh, real quick because you actually gave us some good advice on how we can actually go out and and not break the law and and properly bed these things in. <laughs> so because because we deal with so many customers that are building cars for free, that's going to work well for up to say 45 minutes an hour. So what we're going to do when you go out and bed this car in, of course you're going to really pre-check and make sure everything's sealed up, the brakes are working optimally so you know that there's no problems with leaks. And then you're going to bring the car up to about 45 miles an hour and then do a panic stop down to 20. You'll bring the car back up to 45, down to 20. Back to 45, down to 20. And what I told you was, do it with the windows down. Because what you'll start to do is you'll smell the brake. Once you start smelling brake between five to ten of those hard stops, what we'll want to do is two more hard stops from 45 to zero. The nice thing about that is, is we're saturating the system. It's almost like heat treating an axle. We don't want just the outside or the face of the brake pad to be heat treated. We want the entire brake system to be up to temperature so that the binders from the brake pad material get onto the face of the rotor. That's really important. So once we do those two more stops, which is also a nice time to check your bias and make sure that no wheels are locking up. On this particular car, not as big of a problem because it's not ABS. Right. So after you do those stops, you want to look at the rotor and make sure that we've got some bluing or purpling coloring that's going from the cast iron rotor where it's trying to dissipate into the aluminum hat. If we've got some coloring there, we know that even the brakes are smoking, sometimes they will, that's totally fine. After we know that we've inspected the brakes after those hard stops, you're going to want to cruise it around the block quite a few times using a minimal brake to get them pulled back off to less than 250 degrees then let the car sit until it's down to ambient you'll have a well bedded system excellent and then is that something you'll need to do uh, a, a similar process whenever you put fresh pads on it or is it once you have a, a seasoned rotor if you're adding a new pad to it is the process a little bit more streamlined well, like we talked earlier, if, if you're going to be going between a street pad and then to a waste pad, you're going to want to clean the face of the rotors off with, say, a piece of 80 or 36 grit, uh, grit sandpaper. Don't turn the rotor because you're taking mass from the rotor then. 
then you'll want to put your pads back in and do a, a quick bed in. But if, let's say three months from now, you go through the BP30s that are in this car, JG, what we're going to want to do is the rotor will already be quote unquote seasoned like you explained. We'll want to put the new pads in and then go through that same bedding procedure so that the binders from that new pad get onto the face of the rotor. Okay. So, all right, we will. Okay, uh, one last question. Uh, David Moser is asking about discounts. Uh, I mean, look. Uh, obviously, you have a you have a mortgage to pay. You got um, mouths to feed there. But give us some some hints. Are there are there better times to buy Will Woods than others? You guys you guys have sales periodically. Is is whenever I call Will Wood the the best time? Give us give us some shopping advice, and I, I will I will not tell the folks in in sales that we had this conversation. Well, I am in sales, so that's okay. Kind well, of <laughs> then I'm 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 outed. Then I think is what what should happen. Well, what I'll, here's here's what I'll explain is, we as a manufacturer, we sell. So if you buy if you call Wilwood and you want to buy directly from us, the price that we quote you is going to be a full retail or retail call, okay? But what we're going to want to do is make sure that we select the correct components for your application, build a bill of materials with you, the end user, then try to find a distributor that may be offering a sale or has those groups on the shelf. And most importantly, find someone who understands what you're gonna be doing with the vehicle so that you'll have a lot of knowledge from them as well, especially if they're a distributor that's using our product, that's invaluable. Awesome. So you guys can can make that love connection and and hook somebody up for the for the lifetime of their product and not just for a for for a sale. I I, I, I like that and that's 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 a fantastic answer and I hope uh, I hope David stuck around to um, stick with that. Oh, uh, you guys, I I did not know this and I, I feel bad about this. You guys are the spec Corvette break for for NASA. It sounds like. Yes, we are. Yeah. What what is what is that? Is that a similar kit to this, or, or is that a little bit, a uh, little bit, little bit different? So the front kit is going to be very similar to the brakes that you just installed on your car, but to meet the criteria that was necessary for the spec series, meaning that it needs to be affordable, we've done a couple things to that brake kit to take some of the cost out. For example, instead of a floating hat rotor, it's the same rotor, but it's a fixed mount hat. As far as the caliper, it's the same caliper, but it's a black anodized, which is much more cost effective. Okay. As far as the pistons, did you see the pistons and the calipers that we sent you? Those are P2 Thermblock pistons. Yeah. Well, we'll get a sh nice shot of them right now. Yeah. So in the Spec Corvette series brake kit that we do, and it's front only, in that particular caliper, it's black anodized and it's a, a plain stainless piston. It is not a thermlock full-blown race piston. And one thing that I've learned about those cars is, because it is a spec class, there's restrictions on the engine. So they'll typically have less horsepower than even the car behind you. Yeah. Yeah, and and what kind of a uh, service life are you seeing out of out of a, a set of pads or, or a set of rotors in that series? So Jake Rosell is one of the guys that's running here in the West Coast series. And he's, in his particular car, he still has three fourths of the of the BP30 material left on that spec series brake kit that we offer, and the rotors are in perfect shape. Wow. That is fantastic. All right, uh, Michael, thank you very much for hanging out with us. I know, I know you guys are after hours there. We appreciate you coming by and spending some time with us, dropping some fantastic knowledge on us, and um, I, you know, I am excited to get this thing finished up and get on the road. And we will stay in touch with you uh, over uh, the weekend and Monday once we actually get this thing rolling because I'm, I'm excited about um, those first couple of ap applications because I, I always I, I am I'm a big fan of driving with with the brakes and I'm a big fan of a of a good responsive uh, good feel brake kit and I am I, I I have I have high hopes for this just sort of looking at what it was like to install and what what it's been like to put together so uh, th thanks very much we will uh, we'll stay in touch and um, thanks thanks for spending your time with us tonight man.
Hey, thank you so much, too, for having us on. All right, we will say goodnight to uh, Michael there. And I will. That was cool. That was... Any questions that they, that they, I need to um, start to dissolve. And, and time is now. And I, I keep talking about it because the more I talk about it, uh, I think the more I can. It is for me to check them out at CRC. Support the world that we live in. So check them out at crcindustries.com. Check them out at any major retailer. Also, our friends at Coney. Uh, you got it. You got you got one more day to send Coney man some love. Coney-na.com. They got that sale going on. It's going to end uh, midnight tomorrow, I think. So I can't promise we're going to have these great Coney deals after that. So if you're on the fence, this is the time to make that decision. Buy some Coney shocks. Uh, what else? Oh, uh, Auto Books, Aero Books, our friends at Auto Books. Lynn St. James is going to be there. Lynn St. James, all her stories, all her history, signing books, hanging out, doing cool stuff there. Literally every week they have something going on there at the store in Burbank. And if you can't make it out to Burbank, check them out online at autobooks-aerobooks.com. And finally, our newest friends at, uh, at Pen Grade Oil. See the sign right over there. We're going to have some of them on the show. We're going to be actually changing the oil uh, all uh, 14 quarts or whatever it is in David's 911 in a couple weeks. Uh, of course, the Porsche Club of America. Pen Grade Oil is the official oil of the Porsche Club of America because it is specifically formulated. They have specific and designed formulations for the older cars that we know and love. Our, our old 911s, our old Triumph TR4s and TR6s, uh, our old 240Zs, anything with with a lot of metal to metal pressure inside the engine. You need that zinc, baby. You gotta get that zinc, you gotta get that phosphorus. Uh, pen grade oil is the stuff that has it if you don't need to worry about going and getting a zinc additive, just get the good oil and that's what you use. Uh, check them out at pengrade.com and you can, actually they're showing up in more and more retailers all over the place. We got uh, two places right around here, high performance shops that sell it so you can just walk in and buy the stuff. It's very cool. That is it. Thank you uh, very much for hanging out with us uh, tonight. I, you know, a week after uh, jaw surgery, I, I made it through. I'm very proud of myself. Thank you all for um, supporting me in, in my time of need. If I have any extra pain pills left over, somebody send me an email. Maybe we'll send some of those out for, uh, for, for a nice prize. Actually, uh, before we get, you want to just free, can we, can we do this free, free stick? Do, 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 you guys, do you guys remember, there used to be this thing uh, called TV auction. And it was the greatest thing in the world. You remember TV auction, David? So it was, it was, this was before the internet. Yeah, okay, this, is, this was before the internet. Um, this was before uh, you know, home shopping. And it was, it was on cable access in St. Pete. And it was this dude, it was late at night. This guy, guy would come on and he would, he would say, and it was, it was bull crap. It was all, like, he was just selling warehouses and full stuff. But he would do it like an auction. People would, I don't even know if there are people on the phone. People would call him and be like, hey, we got, we, we got these levels. We got 16.95. Okay, I, I, 16.95. Okay, I got a bid for 17. 17. 17. Get, 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 here's 17.50. So he'd start bidding these, these these things up, and then, and then at one point he would just stop everything, and he'd pretend. I, I don't even think there was anybody else there. He'd pretend he was talking with somebody off the stage. He would be okay. 17.50. Here's 17.75. We got a call for 17.75 from Punta Gorda. We're gonna take that. No, you know what, Larry? No, just stop, stop, stop. Hang the phones up. Larry, Larry, turn the phones off. Here's what we're gonna do. You, are you listening to me? Here's what we're gonna do. Thirteen dollars, thirteen dollars, and, and, and the, 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 there would be bells and stuff going off. It was the stupidest thing in the world and I would watch it for hours. And now I'm making you, I'm not making you listen to a story about it. Um, all right, folks, that is it. Um, thank you very much for hanging out with us tonight. Uh, we'll see you again. Next week, Wednesday night, 9 p.m., we will be back here in the shop or maybe in the office talking to somebody from far away, telling you cool stories and showing you all the cool stuff we do at Grassroots Motorsports Magazine. I promised you free stickers. Uh, here we go. If you want free stickers, if you want two free stickers from Grassroots Motorsports, um, David, can we do this? Can we do the free stickers? No, you know what? I'm doing it. Grassrootsmotorsports.com slash free stickers. 
go to that go to that website. Uh, you will get two free stickers from Grassroots Motorsports just for being our friend. We're going to want your email address and your your you know physical address to mail them to. Two free stickers from Grassroots Motorsports. Give them a good home. And every once in a while, we throw a little bit of CRC goodness in those free sticker packages and send it out to one of our viewers. So hopefully that will be you this next week. That's it, folks. Thank you very much for watching. Thanks very much to Chris Tropia running the camera. Thanks very much to David Wallens back there running our social media. We'll see you again next week, Wednesday, 9 p.m., Grassroots Motorsports Live, presented by CRC Industries. Thanks very much to Coney Penn uh, Grade Oil and Auto Books Dash Aero Books, as always. I'm JG Pastor Jack. Good night, everybody.